All right, thanks. Uh, hello, everybody. Welcome to the, the post-lunch presentations. Hopefully, everybody's got some caffeine in your system and not in a food coma at this point. Uh, I am Jeff LeBlanc. I am the director of the user experience group at Integrated Computer Solutions. And this talk is a design style talk. So there's actually not going to be much in the way of QT nuts and bolts in here, just so people are aware. This is more on the, the design front. Um, even though it's not a software presentation, just so you guys know a bit about my credentials, uh, I've actually been a software engineer for over 20 years. And I have the distinction of being the first certified QT trainer in North America from back in 2003 or so. And I think that was QT 3.1, thereabouts. So uh, I've done a lot of QT programming over the years. And I've had the opportunity to kind of go from programming into running a design team. Uh, and I also teach a graduate course in human-computer interaction uh, back on the East Coast. So it's a little picture of me and my dog back in Boston a few years ago. We had a particularly cold winter. Um, so I want to get started by making sure you guys are actually awake and asking a question, or a couple of questions. First one, kind of a simple one. Who here has, in QT or in any other languages, coded up a user interface because you actually like coding user interfaces? Yeah, good amount of people in this talk, excellent. So my next question is, who here has coded an interface because, you know what, you've got a great set of back-end code and you need to slap a UI on the front of it so your end users can actually do something with it? And more people put their hands up, which is usually the case when I'm dealing with a programming audience. So <clears throat> what I want to do is kind of give you guys some incentive to care a little more about the user interface and the user experience and not just say, yeah, it's an afterthought, it's something I have to do in order to get my code to actually work for people. Why should you care? Well, you know, QT and QML are great toolkits, but they really focus on the nuts and bolts aspect of things. They focus on the how of getting pixels up on the screen, but they don't actually focus on the what part. What is it that your application is doing? As software developers, you guys care about the how. You have to care. That's your job. The end users, by and large, do not care how cool your backend code is, how efficient the networking code is, you know, how amazing it is to program in QT. They care about what? What does this app do for me? And that's really something that it's hard for us to really wrap our heads around because when we're programming, we're so down in, in the guts of things and working on the technology. But you have to remember that the end user doesn't see the code, they see the end result. And they are affected, for good or for ill, by the design. Badly designed software has an effect on people. And you know, think about it in your own lives, any time that you've had to use a piece of software that really didn't have a good interface, you know, how did that affect you? Did it stress you out? Okay, did it cause you to make mistakes or make errors as you were doing things? You know, and you know, how, you know, how annoyed were you as, you're like, boy, who coded this? Why am I dealing with this? How did this ever ship? You know, you, you have a visceral reaction to it. And that's in the simple case. Imagine if this was a piece of software that was for a medical device system or for a nuclear power plant control. And oops, I made a mistake because of a bad user interface. What might happen? Um, the picture I have on there, on this slide, is from a book called The Human Factor um, by an author named Kim Vicente. And it gives some really scary stories in there about what happens in cases of bad design. Um, bit of a spoiler, there's some death in there. You know, bad design really can cost lives. Worst case. Simple case, it might even just cost you to lose customers. You know, if you're running a business and people are stepping away from your application because it's badly designed, that affects you. Conversely, good design helps people out. It increases job performance of people who are using the software. It may actually save lives okay, by making it so that somebody in the medical profession doesn't make a crucial mistake at 3 o'clock in the morning when they're tired, but they have to help save somebody's life. Good design matters. You know, from a business perspective, it makes people want to use your product and keep using your product. If you're in the mobile world, it's even more challenging because statistics show that from download to install to first time you run something, you've got about 30 seconds. You have to capture the user's attention and get that, that visceral impact of, hey, this is pretty cool. 
if you don't do that, they move on. They uninstall it and they move on to the next free app that's on the iTunes store. That gut impact, that visceral experience as we call it, is what makes people want to use your app and it makes them, which is good for your business, recommend it to other people. You know, think about it. If you've downloaded an application going, hey, I, I downloaded this new app for navigating my way through San Francisco traffic and it's really good. I'm going to recommend this to all my friends. If you're the guy who wrote the app and you're getting a buck a piece, he's very happy. That's what user experience does. It helps on the business side of things. And there's a lot of studies out there that show that companies that focus on user experience in the long run do better than companies that don't. I mean, exhibit A, Apple. I mean, that's their stock and trade. They've really spent so much time on getting that amazing experience, and that keeps people coming back and gives them a rapidly ro loyal fan base. A couple of studies that I've seen. Uh, I've seen one study that showed, I forget what the actual application was, but this was a kind of a consulting organization, Wixon and Jones. They did a study, their client made an 80% in their revenue increase just by focusing on usability, not adding features, not working on performance, although performance somewhat does impact usability, yes, but just focusing on making things easier to use, more intuitive to their target users, which is an important phrase that I'm going to come back to. User experience can reduce training costs, it can reduce support costs. Okay? McAfee, they did back in 2005. They um, made an effort to improve the user interface on some of the dialog boxes that people had to interact with. It dropped their support calls by 90%. Think about that. If you're the product manager for McAfee and support is an expense, your support expenses drop 90%. You're buying scotch for that team at the end, right? People are going to be very happy from a business perspective. So UX matters, you know, not just to the people using it, but from the business perspective as well. So I use the term user experience or UX a lot. Um, a lot of you might have heard more be thinking of user interface rather than UX and kind of thinking, what's the difference? Well, think of it this way. Any piece of software that you use has an interface to it. Whether it's pixels, whether it's voice, whether it's gesture, whether it's near field communication, whatever it might be, but there is some type of an interface between the user and the software. Okay? That's a UI, simple case. But the user experience is kind of a, a broader question. Just because a software has a user interface doesn't mean that you enjoyed using it. So the UX is kind of broader. Did you enjoy using it? Or at minimum, did you not hate it? Right? User experience is kind of that notion. You want it to be positive or at minimum not negative because that's what's going to make you guys, the users, recommend it to other users and want to kind of keep that chain going. So UX is, is a bit broader. Now, kind of the, the crux of the question is can software engineers do user experience? Well, yeah, I mean, there are plenty of pieces of software out there that have user interfaces that were developed by software engineers. The question is, are they the good ones? Maybe yes, maybe no. The challenge here is that software people are, generally speaking, not the end users of the software that they're creating, okay? Generally. I mean, it's, it's a broad pie to start carving up here, but if you think about software that's written for doctors, for physicists, for chemists, for deep sea divers, you know, for, for a vast variety of people, and that's probably not you. Software engineers have a particular mental model. Okay? If I were to put my engineer hat back on, engineers like to solve problems. That's what we do. We like to make things better. We like to figure things out. Lots of people don't. Okay? That is a different mental model. People like things to just work. Um, one of the examples at the keynote last night was about the automobile. Turn the wheel, push the pedal, car goes forward. That's a nice mental model. It's not an accurate one of the, the physics of the thing, but that's what makes people happy. So engineers have a different mental model. They think like technical people. Techies like to figure things out. A lot of other people don't. One of the key takeaways here is know thy user. Right? It was a quote from the 70s by a gent named Fred Hansen, and it just means know who you're designing for. So keep in mind that, by and large, you're not the target user. UX designers 
try to think like the target users and they have a different skill set than software engineers and when they work together, great stuff happens. All right, so what I'm gonna do is I wanna give you guys, and I'm gonna go through these fairly quick for time, um, a set of rules that you can take and when you walk out of here, you can walk back to your desks and you can start to apply these to whatever software that you're doing right now. Uh, these were from a gentleman named uh, Professor Ben Schneiderman. He's one of the rock stars in the UX field. Teaches at the University of Maryland. So, eight guidelines for UX design. Here we go. Number one, strive for consistency. Okay, consistency can be within your product, just within the, the screens and dialog boxes of your product. It can be across all the products in your company. It can be across the industry. You know, if you're going to implement a, a copy feature and you want an accelerator, make sure it's control C because that's what people are expecting. This one is probably the most violated rule in software. Okay? Just because you as an engineer might design a good set of screens, but then you move on to another project, a new guy gets hired, he or she works on something, and does something slightly different than what you did and doesn't bother to check. Now things are out of sync and inconsistent. Right? As much as we pick on Microsoft, they've done a, a good job with kind of keeping their products consistent across a suite of families. You know, you look at these examples from Office and you go, yeah, these are more or less in the same family. You know, consistently good. Second rule, catering to universal usability. Right? That's the notion of designing software so that it'll work for the widest range of realistically possible users. It's hard to just say design for everybody. You gotta look and you say, who are we designing for? Are they young, are they old? Male or female, are there color blindness issues? Are there low light issues? Are there cultural issues? Think about who you're designing for and where they're gonna be using it. Great example, anybody remember the movie The Abyss back in 1991, okay? End of the movie, minor spoiler, Ed Harris is down at the bottom of the ocean trying to defuse a nuke. All he has is that light stick and he's talking to the people upstairs and they're saying, okay, Cut the blue wire with the white stripe, not the black wire with the yellow stripe, under a green light stick. We'll hope that ended well, okay? But if, they had, if the designers had used some secondary coding, like one of the wires had a stripe on it, there wouldn't be a color deficiency issue here. Right. Rule three, offering informative feedback. Always make sure that the user understands that if they push a button, something's happening. Right? Maybe you have to go and do a long file load or database sync or whatever it is, and now the application is just kind of sitting there. If you're a user and you push a button and nothing happens, what do you do? Press it again and again and again and again. Now all those signals are going across to that slot connection that says load big database. You have a problem. Give the user feedback. Let them know something's happening. Yep, we got your input. It's cool. We'll get to it. Stand by. Rule four, dialogues. When you use dialogues, which is a questionable choice, quite frankly, but if you do them, make sure that they're obvious what they do. There's an obvious reason it's up, or an obvious reason to get out of it. Look at this one. Are you sure you want to delete something and there's only an OK button? If you're not sure you have a problem, badly designed dialog box. This is my number one favorite. Right? Prevent errors. Make errors as impossible as possible. If the user can't do something, gray out the action. If the user has to make a selection, put up a combo box instead of a free typing field. Provide automatic completion. Use the QT validators. Those are great. I've been using those since the QT3 days. They work wonderfully. It is better to prevent an error in the first place than slap up an error dialog. Users don't want to see dialogues. They just want stuff to work. And when they put something in to the best of their ability and they hit OK and then they get a big red box that comes back that basically says, you suck, you missed something, they are not happy about it. Right. This is a good, an interesting one from Google Docs. Right? I can type in a whole bunch of text, highlight it, right click, I get a pop-up menu that says cut, copy, paste. Excellent, I'll, collect, I'll hit copy. Surprise, you get a dialog box that says, yeah, you can't actually do that. Why don't you try control C instead? Well, then why'd you give me control C? Why'd you give me copy as a menu option in the first place? You're basically leading me right into an error. For the life of me, I can't fathom that one. Okay. Some dialog boxes that actually come up with error messages. I love the, that dark blue one from the Windows 10 setup. Something happens. <laughs> yep, I gathered that by the fact I'm looking at you. Not really helpful, though. You know, if you have to put up a dialog box, 
Make the thing useful. Don't make the user guess. Don't make them you know, feel like, boy, I must have done something wrong. I feel dumb. Because it happens. You know? uh, I've got friends who are teachers. And some of them are fairly computer phobic because they say, I don't like computers. It makes me, they make me feel dumb. That should never be. Along the same level, giving them a safety net. Rule number six, providing easy reversal of actions. That means undo. Yes, undo is painful to code. I get it. I've been there. But they need it. You know, If you put in undo or some type of other safety net, some way to restore defaults, whatever it might be, it encourages exploration. It helps them to actually go through. The end users will want to use your code. They'll go through. They'll experiment. And maybe they'll find that cool feature that you put in as an Easter egg sometime. But if they're afraid of it, they won't want to use it. Having a mechanism for reversal is almost always better than putting up one of those, are you sure you want to do this, dialogues. You're just adding clicks at that point. Let them do it, but give them a safety net to go back if they need to. Rule 7, supporting the internal locus of control. This is, again, making the user not feel stupid. Make sure that they feel in control of what they're doing. Make sure that if they do something, if they take a certain action in the software, the software um, responds in a, in a behavior that makes sense to them in a consistent fashion. If you've ever gotten way down in a complicated piece of desktop software and gone, how did I get here? And how do I get back? Okay. You've lost that locus of control. So providing um, flexibility, providing customization, letting users set up their own shortcuts, it keeps them in control of things. Now, that way they don't feel like, boy, the software is smarter than I am. Finally, rule number eight, reducing the short-term memory load. Right? This is an interesting one. Um, making sure that the user does not have to remember things across screens. Let's say that you have a setup system that you're doing. And those are typically wizards, but they could be other things. Um, Maybe the user does something on screen one and they need to revisit it on screen four. You know, it's enter that value that you entered previously. Well, why do I have to do that? Why didn't the software actually remember that for me, keeping track of these things? This actually gets into um, some of the elements of cognitive psychology. Um, there's kind of a, a notion called chunking that's out there. And what chunking means from a memory perspective is that on average, people can only kind of keep in what's called working memory seven plus or minus two chunks of information at any one time. <clears throat> yes, yeah, some people can do more than that. And you know, if you sit there and try to rote remember something, going over it in your head so you can you know, kind of put it into almost long-term memory, you can get around that. But by and large, it doesn't work too well. Take an example of phone numbers, OK? 10-digit phone number. You tell somebody your, your phone number. OK, well, wait a minute. Let me go and, and type that in. But maybe they can't type it in because they don't have their phone or whatever. They have to try to remember it. 10 digits is outside the chunking range. Again, some people can do it. But think about how you remember phone numbers. Okay. Um, example from Boston, if I had to tell somebody the ICS number, and I'd start with 617. 617 is a very common area code back in Boston. So if somebody told me 617, I chunk that information. It's not 617. It's 617. Okay, that now becomes one chunk of information in my head, and I don't have to really remember it as a discrete thing. Now I've got the rest of the digits of the number, the other seven, so now I'm into eight digits, and that puts me well within my nice chunking range. Okay, so if, if people, for whatever reason, have to remember things, have to juggle it in their heads, try to reduce it so that they don't have to juggle too many complex things at once. Again, for an average user, some, there are other uh, more complex applications. Maybe it's OK, but by and large. Uh, this is an example from um, a piece of software that, that we put out called Project.net, which is project management software. It basically goes in and lets you color code things. But this nicely tells you what colors are already in use. It actually lists the project. So if I'm going, oh, I'm making a new project, and I want to put something as a color to it, I don't have to go, did I use that shade of green? Oh, no, it's available. OK, so I can select that safely without having to remember all of the other things that are in there. Computers are great at memorizing things. People, not so much. All right. So I went through those fairly quick. Uh, again, more for time than anything. 
Um, if you're interested in seeing and reading some more examples and some more depth of it, the, the second link on there for ICS.com slash blog, uh, we actually did a blog series on all eight of these earlier in the year and really put a lot of examples in there from desktop software, from mobile software, um, you know, just lots of different things out in the industry to try to really illustrate these. So you guys should be able to take this notion and go back to your desks and think about whatever software that you're working on right now. Think about how you would apply these guidelines to whatever it is. Think about how to make your application more internally consistent. Think about how to reduce the number of error dialogues that you have in there by providing validators or graying out that OK button until the user has actually entered all the information that's in there that works adding tooltips on top of buttons that are grayed out so that it actually tells the user, hey, this is grayed out for a reason. Okay, there's, there's just a long list of things that you can do as programmers that honestly isn't that hard to do that's going to make your end user's life a lot easier, and they will appreciate it. Right? So one of the common things that I get asked is, what's a good book on design? And it's a hard one for me to answer because honestly, there are so many good books out there. But this is the one that if I'm, I'm teaching a class and somebody asks it, um, I go with this one. It's called The Design of Everyday Things by Donald Norman uh, from back in 1988. And it is what it implies. It's designing stuff. And you think, well, I'm, I'm a software person. I, I don't design physical things. I, I work in cyberspace. But there's actually a lot of good design guidelines that you can get out of this. Have you ever walked up to a building that you've never been to before and bounced off the door because you didn't know if it was push or pull? Right? That's bad design. Right? The, the guiding rule that throughout this entire book is that if the user is confused, it's not because they're dumb. It's because the person who did the design honestly did not do a good job. And that's something that you guys can kind of take to heart. You know? We're software engineers. We're QT programmers. We're smart folks. We can crack this. Take these guidelines, apply them to whatever it is that you're doing. You can make better software. It's going to help your business, and it's going to help the people who are actually using the software. It's going to make them happier as a result. So I went through this fairly quick. Again, we were kind of pressed on time for these short talks. But to recap, UX, it's a competitive advantage. right? From a business perspective, it's worth focusing on. Um, it will help you in the long run. And again. Design can either save lives or cost lives if you're working on enterprise software. So it's worth spending the time. If you're not sure, go to the web, consult professionals, talk to UX designers, whatever you need to do to make sure that you've got the right answer to your design problem. It's a different skill set than software engineering. Okay? It's not totally alien. You can learn it. You can figure this stuff out. You know, I started as a programmer, and I slowly kind of worked over there. But it is an area of specialization as much as within software, network programming is an area of specialization versus graphics programming. It's just a different skill set. All right? Coming out of this, remember and apply. Know thy user, for you are not them. Think about the people that you're designing for. Try to design something that's going to work for them. Try to be consistent in what you do across your product, across your company's products. Make errors as impossible as possible. Get rid of error dialogues. Right? The users will appreciate it. And finally, design first, code later. You know, the compiler is not going anywhere. Start with the whiteboard, figure it out what it is, talk to your user, make sure that you're designing the right product, not a cool product that's not actually going to help somebody in the long run. That's all I got. I'm out of time. So I'd like to say thank you for coming, and I am here for any questions. Thank you. Not that I can actually see you guys as an audience, but any questions out there? Do, uh, so hello all, uh, do we have any questions? I can. So sp on styling, mm -hmm. do you have recommendations on how to, s the best practice for styling QT apps, as in hard coding properties, using style sheets, mm -hmm. um, skins? Like, like all things, the answer is it depends. Um, I like style sheets. Um, 
I've heard there's some discussion about how they are in terms of performance, whether there's performance issues with them or not. I've never heard a conclusive answer on that. Um, best I've heard is that if you're changing your styling a lot, then style sheets might not be the way to go. Maybe you do want to spend the time and actually code up a full Q style to do it. But if it's something where it's kind of, yeah, we want to set a particular look and feel, and it's generally going to be set once, maybe twice, um, style sheets can work reasonably well for you. But it really depends on what it is you're doing and what you're trying to accomplish. Other questions? Yeah. Sometimes when we do the UI design, we face a group of a new user and a group of expert user. Mm -hmm. The new user turn have we need some a lot of the gui guidance and uh, some mm -hmm. very kind of verbally dialogue to guide them to some place, but uh, as per user don't like it. Mm -hmm. They know what's going on there, so they, right, they like everything one in control. It's make the UI very hard to design to please these two groups of users. Is there any kind of suggestion for this? Yep, what you're, what you're talking about is kind of a multi-level interface, um, and it's, it's fairly common. So the trick to, one of the simple tricks at least, is to make sure that the power users, the ones who are not going to like the, um, the simple interface, if you will, have shortcuts. Make it easy to you know, get to complex things. So maybe the, the new user has to go through a menu or a set of screens to get something, but the power user can hit Control F2 and jump right to it. So the power user has their shortcuts, but the new user has their handheld until they become familiar with it. Now that's one way to do it. Um, tutorials are a way to do things. You know, a lot of video games do this. You'll play the first level as a tutorial, and it teaches you the game, and then you can jump into the more interesting stuff. But then if you're an advanced user, you can say, yeah, I'm just going to skip out of this and jump right to the, the meat of it, if you will. So those are a couple of techniques you can apply to that. But it, it is a common problem, and there are techniques for getting around it. Right. I'll take that as a last question. Uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, thanks, Chef, for that informative and educative talk that, that, we, uh, that right. we delivered. Thanks, everybody. Uh, Cheers.